uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to come and, and meet you. Um, I had really great um, sense of, of, of people that really are really very nice, almost like Texans, you know, like. Uh, like <laughs> so, so it's really a, a good experience. So, so my, my, uh, the title to my presentation or my workshop is Evangelism Beyond the Red Doors. And as you can recognize, this is our building right there where I'm at in Maynard, Texas. And I'm Alex Montesbella. So this is one way that you can contact me. That's one way that you can follow me or follow what I'm doing. I was born in Peru. I don't know if you, uh, anybody, I know somebody told me that they had been in Peru just recently. And, but, uh, okay, yeah. And in a town called Huacho, which is about, uh, a little, about maybe four hours north of uh, Lima. And, and when I was seven years old, my family moved to Guatemala. Uh, anybody been in Guatemala here? Guatemala, yeah, yeah. So my father went to seminary in Guatemala, so we moved there when I was seven years old. And four years later, uh, we came to the United States. One thing that my dad did is that he planted a church. He started a church as a seminarian. And it was a four-year program where he uh, studied. So in the four years, they, they were able to buy um, some land and get, some, uh, get a building uh, built. Uh, and people from Texas came to help him build it. And when he, was, when he graduated, they asked him, would you want to come to Texas? And he accepted, and that's how we, we came in. That car right there that you see, my, our transportation before the car has always been motorcycle, where all four of us will go, you know, like the kids in the middle and the mom in the back and the dad, and, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, you had to hold on, you know, really, really tight. We became very close. Yes, we did, yeah. We, we, <laughs> very close family. But the car uh, was... Uh, giving us a raffle there at the seminary where he was studying, and he won the car. Not even knowing how to drive it or anything like that. So, and he won the car. It was, a, it was from the family, it, some missionaries from Michigan. And so he had the, uh, it was a beautiful car for us. And I, I, I'm pretty short, right? But my dad is a little bit shorter than, than me, and they, they would see him driving the car. They thought there was nobody driving the car <laughs> in the beginning. You know, but, uh, so he learned to drive. And a few weeks later, we drove from Guatemala all the way to the United States. So about two, two days of, of, of um, trip, we became super close with each other, too, because we were just in that small car. And everywhere we went, he, my father made sure that he could just drive off because he couldn't go backwards. What do you call it? You know? And so everywhere he went, he would park. So he, we could just start our next uh, part of the trip uh, unless he couldn't. So he had to get somebody from... Wherever, you know, can you back up my car and, and then get on our way? Uh, that's my sister and my dad now, and, and with my mom and my dad. Depending on what day it is, she will have a different color of hair. Uh, and I don't know if you guys know, but she's, she's a great singer. Um, and my wife, she's from Vietnam. Uh, and she was born in Pleiku in, in 1975, the same year that I was leaving uh, Peru. She left Vietnam. So it was, we always say that we left at the same time, you know, just so we can meet in Texas, you know, in Houston, Texas. Uh, and she was a, a member of 12 brothers and sisters wow. in there. And my wife is the one in the middle right here. And you can just imagine it's a, it's a large family with, with cousins and, and so forth. So from my, this is my, my kids and my wife. And my, my son just got married uh, some years ago to somebody from El Salvador. And so my family is becoming more, you know, yeah, more, more international, I would say. Uh, and that's how we looked just uh, a few weeks ago as we celebrated my mom's uh, birthday. Um, and where is Maynard? Because I, I think you asked me, you know, where's Maynard or, or Manor? It's actually pronounced Maynard. It's right out, out of Austin. Is this Maynard right here? Is it the Austin area right here? Austin? Um, and that's my context. You know, this is my context. Does anybody need me to, to say things in Spanish? Alguien necesita que lo haga en español? Porque lo puedo hacer en las dos cosas. I can do it in both. So what I want, what I, what I want to invite you right now is, I know I see people in different tables. If you can kind of introduce, uh, how many of you, you know each other already? You guys kind of know each other, yeah? So why don't you introduce yourselves to each other and, and then say the first thing to comes to mind you know, share this when you, when you hear the word evangelism, okay? And so you can uh, introduce yourself to each other and then say, what is the first thing that you think about or, or, you know, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word evangelism? So just within the tables. Yeah, within the tables. Within the tables. 
Hang on, I, uh, I'll join you. Hi, I went to the gym. Well, thank you for participating. I see that you guys are re I mean, uh, I really like your conversations. So what kind of things did you guys hear when you were talking about evangelism? What, what, are, what are, because I heard some things outside when I was walking around, people were asking me what I was doing here. Uh, the big E and things like that, you know, so <laughs> things that were here, you know, they're like, what, is, what are they asking us to do? So what kind of things have you heard? Let me, anybody would like to share what you heard among yourself? Somebody with white shoes, okay. And um, <laughs> someone screaming from the street corner. Okay. And then um, reaching out to people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I forgot my white shoes. So the next time I'll bring my... <laughs> yes. Walking, sharing, prayer, and how to get out of the scary place that evangelism serves. How about back here? We heard a lot about how um, evangelism, like you can do it through action as well. Um, it can be very relatable. Um, anything as far as reaching out to your community. Uh, Mel was telling us about how at St. John's India, they have a um, music program open to the community uh, for children at that fest. Um, so that's just that's a form of evangelism where you can uh, take the opportunity to share God's love through um, showing people what it looks like. How about, how about right here? <laughs> <laughs> we heard um, get out of the church, out of the church. Um, sharing good news, bringing people to Jesus, bringing people into the church. We talked about that there was a, a fair, a church fair, well, a monastery fair, actually, <coughs> that brings the neighborhood in. Um, like cathedrals putting Celtic skelters, okay. fairground rides inside yeah. a cathedral. <laughs> 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 How about this fellow right here with a Texas hat right here? <laughs> the first thing that we developed was that the love of God can be shared. The gospel, the salvation can be shared. And that sharing of love is evangelism. And I'm sure that there are many ways to express it. I think that outreach to the community and service to others also allows you the channels to express that love and to give you the opportunities to talk about the gospel to others and to give them the possibility of salvation through that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you guys over there? Now? We had also shared a lot about um, examples, uh, being examples and um, how uh, witnessing when Christ has actually worked in miracles in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, how about this group again? You asked for the first word that came in our mind. Mm -hmm. The first word that came into my mind is that evangelism is one of the bishop's five goals. <laughs> 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 Yes. I remember the first time I said that it was for my father who was Baptist. And in his impression, he looked forward to it when the text of the come true. And um, just read about Amy, some of the was her last name. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what a production she used to put on as well. Thank you so much. Well, I have a definition that I found on the internet now. <laughs> in the, <laughs> actually, in the in the Episcopal Church's website about evangelism, it, uh, it reminds us of where this word came from and what it means, you know, about gospel, glad tidings, or good news, uh, and what Jesus invited us, you know, to go into the world to be able to share this good news. 
So if it's good news, I mean, I think when people share good news, you know, if you win the lottery or something like that, people going, I mean, now that we have social media, it just goes everywhere, right? And, and people like to share those kind of things, things that they consider good news, right? Um, I know that when I, when I get a good um, uh, score on, my, on a test, you know, I'm, I want to tell everybody, you know, I want, I want to tell people the, the good news. And so for me, you know, it's asking that question, but what, what is good? Because it seems like there's a lot of fear on this word. And like, it's gonna, what, what am I supposed to be doing? I don't know it. Like, I need to be prepared. I need to, I need to go to school to know how to do this. Where I think what, you, what I've been hearing here about uh, in, in what you just um, shared is that it's about your own experience, or you have experience, and now you're kind of sharing it to others. And you're trying to interpret whatever you experience to different contexts. Uh, so if, if we, when we look at scripture, this is some of my favorite verses right here. You know, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. Anybody know that one right there? <laughs> Heard that one? So just making sure. You know, like I remember the first time that I came to the States, I saw on the TV somebody with a sign that said John 3.16. And had a, like this colorful, yeah. I was okay, like, man, everybody's a Christian there in the United States. That's what I thought. <laughs> Another of my favorite verses is this one from the Psalm 36. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. You know? This is experience. You know? This is what I've experienced. And not only have read it and memorized it, but I've experienced that in my, in my, in my own life. You know? And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Yeah. That's, uh, that's good news, right? Yeah. That's good news. I mean, this is something that we see in Scripture. We, we uh, experience it throughout the years in, in our liturgy. But these are great news. And people are looking for hope, right? They're looking like, like what we see in, we seek for love, we seek freedom, abundant life. All of us want those things, right? We want this message, whatever we are sharing, to be loving, liberating, and life-giving. I do. I want that. And that's been my experience. Let me share a little bit about how the, I mean, I, I said that we left Peru and we went to Guatemala. What I didn't mention is that we were in a different denomination uh, that sent my dad to seminary. We were in the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, very different from the Episcopal Church. Yeah. And it was during a time of a very, um, of hardship for my parents. They had, we had come to the United States and a few years later we moved to Houston, which is a bigger city. And my parents were trying to, um, you know, find a place to live, get, get situated in the place before we, they could bring us from South Texas to Houston. Um, and they were, my dad couldn't find a job as a pastor. And he knew, I mean, he had all these different uh, business cards, you know, calling people. Do you have anything? Do you know anything? Can you have, anybody done that before? <laughs> have you heard something like, what, what's, please let me know. No one. Yeah. So he started doing odd jobs. He was uh, uh, doing gardening. He was uh, cleaning offices, and, and he was delivering pizza. And one of these days when he was delivering pizza, he got mugged. So he got beat up really hard, and then took his pizza and his money. And one of the things he says is that he pretended that he just uh, was unconscious, so that the guy would leave, and that was beating him. And he did. So he ended up in a, in a hospital in Houston, looking like Rocky. You can just imagine that with the eyes all big and, and uh, frustrated. Um, not knowing what to do, he again went into all those uh, different business cards that he had, calling people that he knew, and nobody was available. And then he saw this card, this business card from a guy that he had met at an evangelism conference, and he was an Episcopalian. And he said, "Like man, I don't. I, that was the last time I talked to this guy. I wonder if he respond. He's here in Houston." So he called, and the guy answered. And he said, you know, I cannot come right now, right now, because I'm about to do a quinceañera. But as soon as I'm done, I'll be, I'll be there. So I don't know, I mean, maybe an hour later, uh, enters this guy still with vestments and everything on, <laughs> through these doors of this emergency room. And for my dad, it was like seeing Jesus yeah. coming to him. Yeah. You know? and, and, and this priest sat down with my dad, and, he, and my dad cried. He felt embraced with this person that didn't take the, you know, because I, I know that if they call me, you know, I, I'm going to take out my robes and put my sound thing over here and, 
make sure that I look okay before I go and do things. And this guy didn't do none of those things. And that's why we're in the Episcopal Church. Uh, because of this person that left the comfort to go out into the place where the good news needed to be heard. And not only heard, but experienced. And I remember the first time that we, my, when my dad shared this uh, story with us, and we came to this Episcopal Church, and we had grown up seeing everything that looked Catholic with candles and everything was from the devil. I mean, that's how we grew up. And, 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 and I said, like, what are you doing here, Dad? You're like, what is this? What, what is going on here? But we heard the same message being proclaimed. But beyond that, we were seeing it put into action, into real ways. And, and that's how we became, became to the Episcopal Church. So a lot of the, the um, evangelism is really telling those stories. I've told the stories many times. We now hear somebody that needs to hear something like that. I, I tell the story about when I was in the army. How many people have been in the military here? And, and the, uh, I was doing most of my time I did it in Fort Stewart, Georgia. Uh, anybody know Fort Stewart, Georgia? Pretty, um, what do you call it, humid place. <laughs> and, and I was hoping that I was going to finish my four years in the Army there. And right before the, because before the last year, they sent me to Korea. And I was here like, wow, you know, like, come on now. I only have one more year to go. What can you just, you yeah? know? And the, the thing that hurt me is because my wife was expecting a child, our second baby, and I couldn't take them with me. And so I was doing everything. I was going from place to place, nothing. So I ended up going a, a week after my daughter was born. I was on the plane to go to South Korea. Uh, I arrived there, and I was so angry. I was angry with everybody. I mean, I thought everybody was having a good time there. And I could see them smiling, eating, and doing all the different things. I, I couldn't do that. And, and I remember going into my room and, and being, like, frustrated. And I even tried to cry, but I couldn't. I don't know if anybody has been in a situation when you cannot cry. And I tried. And I was trying to, I, I would make the sounds. Like, uh, 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 and, and nothing would come out. And, and, that was, and that went on for days, months, and months. And then I, you know, I had never drank before. I started drinking there. It was very much accessible there. I mean, you get out of the uh, Camp Casey, Korea, into this um, just like almost like a little city of just bars. You know, first floor, second floor, you, and you were going like, ooh, 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 ooh. And by the time you get, you didn't even know what was, what was happening and how you get home, you know, how you get to your room. Uh, so that was my, 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 uh, my, my routine. <coughs> Everything was just so I could make it through the pain of not being with my family. Seeing that when they sent me some pictures of my daughter that she had changed so much from one moment to the other, and I was missing all those different things. And I was angry. I did, I, I'm a pastor's son, right? Priest's son. He wasn't going to church. I remember people would come to my door on Sunday mornings, and I would turn off the lights, you know, make sure that nobody knew that. <laughs> mm. I know not, none of you have done that right now. <laughs> uh, and they're just, that was my life. Uh, one day I got a box from my family. My sister sent me a box with all, you know, like all these things that you cannot get in Korea, but that I like. And I was so excited, you know, I'll go get it and try to hide it because when you have a box when you're in the military, and everybody's your friend. And, yeah, everybody, everybody wants to see what you have, and, you know, and you have to be generous and, and giving it away and things like that. But I, somehow I got to my room without nobody getting a hold of me and closed my door, turn off the light now. Um, and I opened this box and never saw all these cookies and stuff that, that I like. And in there was a, a cassette. Does anybody remember what a cassette is? Yeah? yeah? You guys know what a cassette, right? Uh, <laughs> and so then I, I said, like, what is this? You know, and, and I went to get my Walkman. Anybody know what a Walkman is? <laughs> you guys remember those things? Yeah? Right? So I opened it, put it in there, and put on my big um, earphones, you know, the orange ones, the ones that had, like, the little, the, like, with, like, foam, like that. And I, and I put play, push play. And the first song that came out was a song called Renuevame, which means renew me. And the, and the song says, Renuevame, Señor Jesús. Renew me, Lord Jesus. I don't want to be the same. Yo no quiero ser igual. Because everything that is within me, porque todo lo que hay dentro de mí, needs more and more of you. Necesita más y más de ti. It was like those words were the words that I had been trying to say for six months. 
in that place of frustration, in the place of darkness, in the place of despair, and hopelessness. And all of a sudden, I felt something. And I rewinded, because you had to rewind. Remember, you could, you, could, you could just click and play again. It was like, yeah. Now I, so you go, and I played it again. And, I, and all of a sudden, almost like the chains that had been grabbing me all those months started to fade away, and the tears and everything came out. And I rewinded it again. And I listened until, until the song was probably going like, because it was stretched. And at that moment, I heard the good news, the prayer that I needed to make, the words that I needed to say. And real, the realization that God was with me even through all those different things that I was experiencing. That's the good news. You know? So in the same way that I'm doing it here, I know that all of you guys have good news to share. There are stories of when you've seen Jesus, when you've seen God in action, not only in, you know, in Scripture, in, but all of a sudden the Scripture becomes a reality in your life. And that's what evangelism is about, of telling that story. Telling a story with different things, like you say, like doing things for people, opening up your space. You know, we're going to talk about the, the um, let me get, get some water, sorry. We're going to talk about evangelism beyond the, the red doors. I mean, in both ways. I mean, we do need to go out because we need to go where Jesus is at. With the, because Jesus is already waiting for us in those places. Um, but also, to be able to break down our own doors so people can experience the good news. So I'm sure that all of you guys have a lot of... Where's my, my sister's story right there? So let's take some time right now, okay, in our small groups again. Uh, and maybe we can come, if some people can come over here to make another group right here. And maybe, uh, so we can share our own story. I, I, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about what that story may be. And then share it with each other. Okay? You guys ready? Would that be okay? Checking with you first because I don't want you to be uncomfortable with a big E. You know, but, okay? So if anybody wants to come here and we'll take some minutes again. Who's So one of the things about the like, thing about telling your story is that sometimes we think that you up in your life. All right. All right, let me get you guys back over here. <laughs> I know, right? Let us pray. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So how did I feel for some of you guys? How did I feel? Great, yeah? I know that in, in our table, they asked, you know, why don't we get more opportunities to do this in our life as communities? I mean, when we, we, we have, uh, like, lunches and things like that, how can you lead people to tell that story? Because the more you do it, the more naturally it becomes. Uh, and it's your story and it's authentic. It's nobody else's story. It's how Jesus showed up in your own, in your own life. So part of it is to find, find those opportunities to do that in your own context. Because I think, how many churches are, are here uh, represented? A bunch, right? Uh, yeah, so, so there's different situations depending on where you're at, different opportunities that surround you. Uh, but, the com but the community itself needs to experience that themselves so to be able to be freed uh, to tell that story. We, in our seminary Magdalene, uh, it's a lot about that. I model it because I tell myself, this is the way that I know how to tell people about Jesus. You know, when I was sent to Maynard, uh, there was no Mary Magdalene. And I didn't know Maynard. I didn't even know it was pronounced Maynard. Uh, and I accepted before even knowing where it was at. So I, and I missed it when I passed through it, and it was a very small <laughs> town. And, and I already had talked to the bishop and everything. I was like, oh, my gosh, what did I get myself into? Um, but it has now become my, my community. And I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about, about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in the Austin. It's about 10 miles from Austin, so very close to Austin. This is my, my uh, 
communion kit or, or portable communion set. All right. Has anybody seen that? Anybody have one of those? Yeah. Uh, I was it, that one was given to me when I uh, when I became a priest when I was ordained to the priesthood by the church where I was doing my curacy and and it's beautiful. It was uh, I had I mean I would shine it all the time, <laughs> make, make sure that it had oils and things like that for the wood and and then the things inside were very beautiful and shiny. Yeah? Uh, and I took care of them. I hardly used it, but I, but I, it was there you know because it had my like you saw it had my name on it. I was thinking like man. I, must be, it must be very important, you know, to have my name on it. And I, and I had it in a place where I could see it. I placed it in a place, you know, like, and when I would pass by it, I would go, oh, wow, you know. And, 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 then, and then shine it a little bit more, you know. And, uh, so I, I was doing, I said, when I moved to Maynard, as you know, there was no community, so I, they, they gave me uh, other tasks to do. And there was a community about 30 miles from where I was at that needed somebody to be there as a priest as an interim, as they, as they search for a permanent uh, vicar for that community. So I spent uh, nine months in that, in that community, which is called San Francisco de Assis, which is in southwest Austin, about 30 miles from Maynard. And there was a lot of activity with quinceañeras, baptisms, weddings, that I had to make sure that I had very, very scheduled and know what I was about to do. I didn't want to baptize somebody that was getting married and, and doing a quinceañera <laughs> with somebody. Like, so those kind of things, you know. And, and it was like that. It was very, very, very booked. You know, and I, and the, that's why they needed somebody to be there. And one, one Friday, uh, a, a woman came you know, to the office and said, I need, I need to talk to the priest. I said, like, I'm, I'm the priest. I need somebody to do the consignment for my, for my daughter. Okay, well, let's look at the calendar. But it's tomorrow. <laughs> I said, like, do you have space here to do it? I said, like, no. I, Look at my calendar. It's all filled up right here with things. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not able to, to uh, fit you in. And then she kept going. Can you please come? I just, you know, you, I just need somebody to bless my daughter. And I made my face, you know, the, the, the priest's face, you know, like with a smile. <laughs> and like, oh, all right, all right, all I can't. You know, it's, uh, yeah. But she was very persistent. I said, like, okay, I'll, I'll go. Tell me where I need to, where is your address? And she told me the address. It was in a town much further from Maynard, you know, another 15 miles from where this church was. I said, I was going to be further away from my house. It's in, it's in the summer in, Houston, in Texas, in Austin. So it's hot, and now I'm going to have to go somewhere else. And wow, you know. Uh, so I hesitantly said, yes. And then so the next day in the morning, coming with all my things, you know, uh, as I was putting in my car, I said, like, so how am I going to take communion to that? To, so I could have the celebration there at their house, you know. So then I, I saw the box and I tried to ignore it. And, and <laughs> going and and so then I, I just said, like, well, I guess this is the, it's horrible, right? I mean, so then I took it and I, <laughs> and I had it on my car. And I got to the church and I was, I was walking from, the, from my car to the, to the building and carrying my vestments and my book of common prayer and, and my kit, you know. And all of a sudden I saw it falling off my hand. And it's almost like slow motion, you know, when things, you know, things that you, like, my box that I shine, that, that I care for, you know, that, that, that gives me meaning. <laughs> and it just hit the, the, the pavement. And I saw the hinges coming off. And the things that were inside flying off, you know, the glass, all these different things, like, in the air. And I was like, I mean, I, with, with, my, with my vestment, my books, and all that stuff, right? Um, luckily, it didn't break. It got some dents and some, uh, but the hinges did come off. The wood did get scratched. Uh, you know, I, I saw the gla the, these glass things pop, you know, bouncing off the ground and into the grass. And I said, like, wow, I survived, but it, I was so angry. And I said, like, wow, you know, just because of these people, you know, <sighs> man, come on, you know. So I put it back and I went and I did all, you know, my baptism, my wedding, and all this stuff, right? Uh, and it came to the time that I needed to go to the house. And it was late in the afternoon. I was already tired. It was hot outside. And, and again, I'm confronted with my box. That's not the box that I had when I came. Yeah. It was all scratched up, destroyed. <sighs> so then I just grabbed it, you know, and got in my car and trying to find a GPS, like, where is this house? And I saw that there was, there was no, it, it, was, it was a trailer park. Mm -hmm. and, and there was no definite 
how, how do you know how to, you know where the house is at? And so I was like, oh my gosh, man, these people better be happy that I'm coming. <laughs> you know, they, they better be, uh, you know, like very grateful that I'm coming, you know, because I'm bringing all this stuff right here and, and driving. And I mean, that was my conversation with myself the whole way. And, and then I found my way to the where, where, where the, where the, where the trailer park was at. And I was thinking, like, how am I going to find that house? And then all of a sudden, I saw some balloons. So I knew that it was somewhere in that direction. So I started driving. I said, like, man, they better have signs saying, welcome, you know, like, you know, thank you for coming or something, you know, like, and a red carpet or something to, so that I could walk on it and, and with my drink and things like that, you know, with a, with a fan. And this is what I wanted. And I said, like, they better be like that. And as I got to the entrance of this uh, property, I saw that they had set up like a table for the for the um, communion with the nice, I mean, with chairs, and, and I saw the kids running and, and, and screaming and laughing, and, and this family frantically getting ready for this thing, for this celebration. And at that moment, I realized that I wasn't bringing something to them. They were bringing something to me. That Jesus was already there celebrating and the reason why I was driving all the way over there was so I could experience Jesus. And what that taught me is that that box needed to break. Yeah, yeah they needed to break so that I could be free to use it yeah. wherever God is calling me, wherever I'm being set, you know, that I needed to be free from having to, like, shine it and make sure that I didn't. It's like when you get a brand new car, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like you park it in, like, on the other side of the <laughs> place, right? And then you walk all the way over there. You, you need somebody to come and pick you up to take you to the place that you're going, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way I felt about the, these things. And what that became a metaphor for my own ministry, because that, at that moment, I was continuing to be evangelized. I was being evangelized with the people that I thought I was bringing the good news. They were evangelizing me. And I, and I knew that that had to have some impact in the way that I would plant and start this community of, of uh, St. Mary Magdalene. So... So this is how we started gathering. It was the first gathering in my house. I had already lived in, in, the, in the area for about a year and a half. And, and I called these people like, hey, you guys want to come and gather with me? Please. And one family accepted and another one there. They're pretty uncomfortable because I had been holding on for this thing for about a year and a half. So I wanted to tell them what we want, where we're going to be doing. And our coffee table in our, in our, uh, in our house became the altar. Uh, and we started gathering there. Very interesting that... When, when, you, when the altar is really low, everybody has access. Everybody can touch. And I remember the kids there, you know, because the people that started coming, people didn't go to church. These were one family that I met at the church where I was doing the interim work. And, and he, but he lived very close to Maynard, closer than to drive all the way over there. He said, like, when you go back to what you're doing, we want to go with you to help you. Um, and they started inviting their own friends uh, and people that were, they had no connection to church. So when kids that have no experience in church they start touching because they see shiny things, right? <laughs> We're pretty shiny and you want to touch. They open the, you know, like the bread box and the, people, like the parents are like, oh, no, what are you doing? But it gave me an opportunity to be able to tell people that this is accessible to all. This is not something that I'm bringing to them or that the visible church is bringing or the church itself. But this is something that is being given free, freely to us and that it's, it's accessible to them. Bless you. They didn't know about the different you know, our routines and our calendars. So I had to do that in my own home. I'm, one, I'm always wondering what people may have said, you know, with the people that were asked. But the other house is like, what are they doing over there? You know, what is that funny stuff, you know? And, and, and little by little, it, so it could become part of their own lives, you know? And they started inviting more people. And that's how it was in, in my home right there. We had a two-story house, so uh, we, uh, the children would have a space, you know, during, during the service to go and, and and, and, and learn in their own language. Uh, and, and that's how, how they are right there. People, you know, when you, uh, when you invite people, you know, <laughs> when you invite people to your home, they go everywhere, you know? <laughs> they go everywhere. And, uh, you know, like, I'm an introvert. I don't know about you guys, but I'm an introvert. My wife is an introvert. You know, we're very private. You know, we, you know when we have people, we, we really plan that. It, but when they, when, People that I didn't know, very different from me, different stories than I, did, than I had. They, go, they went everywhere. They opened the closet, they look inside, uh, they, they, they go underneath, and so forth. 
my wife is a hairstylist, and when they found out that my wife was a hairstylist, there was like people making, um, what do you call it, um, appointments after our gathering to have their hair done and stuff like that. So there were people in my bedroom sitting down almost like a waiting area and people, you know, getting their hair done. And, and I was like looking at the church planting books. It's like, where is this stuff about, you know, like there's n nothing that prepared me to do this. But what he did, it was, try it was evangelizing my wife, myself, and my children. That that's what church is supposed to be about. It's about opening ourselves up, opening everything, that when there's a spill, because there was a lot of spills, like uh, Kool-Aid and, and ju juice and all these different things on my carpet. And it was like, instead of being angry about it, to be able to celebrate that something happened in here. <laughs> I, I should be crying if there's nothing, no stains on my carpet, because there's nothing happening. And that's, 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 these people evangelized me. You know, they, they transformed me in my life. I'm grateful for each of them that they took a, the risk to come and become part of our community. And we ate a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, the first time we gathered, I, I make sure that I had food because I wanted them to stay a little bit longer so I could get to know them and maybe get their addresses and stuff like that, you know. Um, but it became something that we did weekly, weekly, weekly. And they're great cooks. And it's a lot of fun, you know, people with different, different stories, like I said. That's in, in my home. Then we had to move somewhere more public. And one thing that I didn't say is that these are people that came from the, a Hispanic, Latino background, where their church experiences always being in Spanish. That's how they heard it. That's how they knew the songs. That's how they were able to communicate. But the task that they had given me is for this community to be uh, multi-ethnic, that it will resemble the demographics around us, that if this is 60% this, 20% this, that somehow they will start being seen in our community. And I had to convince these people, my brothers and sisters, that we're going to start doing everything bilingually because I knew that I, I, it wasn't my plan. My plan was for everything to be in English because it's the language that may be common. Uh, but I couldn't strip them from who they are. I mean, I'm Latino, but I'm fully bilingual. I've been here for a long time. And I didn't know how to prepare, but we just started doing it. And, and they're like, what are we doing? They were telling me, because I would tr start trying to learn how to preach bilingually. And they were going like, Padre, we no entendemos nada. You don't understand what you're saying, because you're confusing them. It's confundiendo. They said, like, give me a chance. You know, give me, let, me, <laughs> let me get some more experience here. But what they saw is that the children were connecting more with what we were doing. And that was the selling point for them. And so like, maybe we should continue to try. And so they spent with me eight months in my home, you know, just trying to train our ears and our mouths to do these things bilingually. Uh, and like I said, all of us were uh, born outside of the United States. You know, there were Cubans, Nicaraguans, Mexicans, and, and myself and my wife from Vietnam, you know, she was there too. And I pray for this group that became, these are people that didn't go to church, you know. And I asked them, why didn't you go to church? Well, they always look at me funny. They don't like the way my children act. Uh, they, they need to act a certain way. They look at my tattoos. Because it's not, these are the ones that you get in, in downtown Austin. These were the ones you get in jail, you know, prison. And they said, like, you know, they, they start. But these were the real church planters that became part of our community. So we pray for them. I, we got our signs. We, I went to my dad's church, and I got everything I could. <laughs> put them in those boxes. The diocese, the diocese gave us this trailer to put all our things. We rented some sound equipment, and we transformed this uh, cafeteria uh, into our worship space. So that, will be, that was the first time that we actually had almost like a table beyond my coffee table. Uh, and we just used what we had. You know, this, this right here is a chasuble. I don't, I don't think you can tell. It's like, uh, because that, was the only, that matched the, the stuff, you know, the purse and everything. So like, oh, that's going to look good. Uh, it was funny that years later, when somebody made one for us, they put the little hole too on the, you know, for the, because, because, they, because they, thought, they thought that that's the way it was, you know, that's the way, like, what, yeah, yeah. because they said that's the way that we put the thing there, it has to be like that. So I'm wondering, you know, how many things do we do in our churches that begin for a d different reason, and we keep on doing it, the same thing. But, uh, but that became, you know, it's, 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 a, it's something about, our sacramental life is that space just gets created. You know, you, you, know, you transform the space. They give us a lot of access, you know, to use 
the aisles and everything to do our children area, our children's formation area. Uh, and our sign, you know, we did, like I said, we did everything in both languages. And this was the, the first gathering. We didn't invite anybody. You know, we started August the 1st of 2010 in this bar space, and, and we didn't make any invitations or we didn't tell anybody. We wanted to practice being there for at least a month. You know, that month had five Sundays, and so like, let's just make sure that we, we know what we are doing. And some of them, you know, we, the, we, I mean, how do you pass out the, the, the offering plate? You know, we had never done it. And how, I mean, the, and how do you do that? How, who, who are we going to ask? So these are that group right there uh, on uh, August the 1st. But all these other people right here, they came all the way from Houston. They drove two and a half hours, about 60 people, 60 people from my dad's church to come and encourage us. You know? And one of the things that they did is they prayed for all of us. And for my community, that was like, a, it, 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 they were talking for days about how they felt. That they knew that this community or the, the, the community that we were part of was more, beyond Maynard. They saw these people that had experienced something that they were willing to come uh, and be there. And they wanted to, uh, these people from my dad's church, you know, they're all leaders, so they came. They wanted to do all the different things. It's like, no, 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 I need to show uh, my people how to do these things. And, and, and we, so we got to practice and see, you know, what, what could be. And that was our first gathering where other people from the main area came uh, that had heard about us, that had curiosity. Plus, all the people from my dad's church, Past some people from other places that I had uh, been part of my life, my faith walk. And later on in October, just uh, about a month and a half after we had moved to the school, we had our first bishop's visit. And that's when the, uh, the people, because none of them, all, uh, all, only my wife and I and my kids were Episcopalians. We had been received or confirmed. None of these people had been. Can you imagine the Episcopal church that was planted by people that were not Episcopalians? You know? <laughs> and some of them that were, had not even been baptized. So that was when, like officially or formally in a way, they were welcomed into the, this community. And these people right here, they came from Waco, which is 100 miles away from, from Maynard. Uh, and that's where I did my curacy, the ones that gave me that nice looking box. <laughs> and they said, you know, we know that the bishop is coming. We want to cook for you guys so that you guys don't have to worry about anything. But just do, you know, this first thing that you're going to do with the bishop. Uh, and for our community to hear that some people were going to come that were very different from them, they looked very different from this community, they, they came from the different socioeconomic status than they did, and they were going to drive all these miles to, to be with us. So what we, what, I, what we learned was this thing about removing obstacles. And part of evangelism is that. One is to remove the obstacles, to have the opportunity to, to be able to tell your story, to practice that within your community, and then go outside. But... Where are you? Where are you? Where, where are you connecting them to? Yeah, there's so, how many obstacles do we have in our own communities that are prevent from people from becoming part of who we are, or part of this movement, you know, the Jesus movement. So what we learn is that we need to have compassion, we have to have patience, we have to have humility, we have to be flexible because things didn't go always the way we wanted them. But overall, it was about authenticity, you know, and authenticity is being who you say you are. Uh, we try not to put anything on our website or even big signs saying, we're a welcoming church. Because some days we're not going to get it right. But we want people to tell us that about us. We want to tell, t- them to tell us the, the truth about us. So it's, it's easier to be authentic if you don't say you're authentic, right? Yeah. And so, <laughs> so that's part of authenticity. And one thing that I, somebody said about authenticity is that you have to give opportunity to people to experience who you really are. So not only when you go out into the community and in different places, and, and the th- but the, the way that you use your space and how you do things says really who you are. Uh, people tell us who we are. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my, my thinking process is very different from other church planters, where other church planters, they will come up with even a logo and everything with the values all written and, and the colors matching the... The, the words, and I was like, like, man, I can't do that. You know, like, I'm trying, and I tried for many of us frustrated in trying to do that work. And I realized that later on, we found out that those values were being told by others. They said, this is who St. Mary Magdalene is. This is who they are. And I said, let me write it down, you know, so I could know that I, I, I could make my logo with that now. So it's very much about authenticity and being out. You know, where can people experience you? Uh, we got to be at the Lions Club because we didn't have no space. You know, there's some freedom about that, too. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, that not having uh, a, a permanent spot. It's being able to go different places. Yeah, that was our first Christmas Eve service right there, the Lions Club Hall in Maynard. And then we started inviting. We, we put an ad on Facebook saying, do you want to be baptized? And it's like, let's see what people say, you know. And we, you know, those pay um, ads that just goes to people's feeds. And now it, 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 it connects with Instagram, too. They put it on Instagram and see what people say. And people started co connecting with that post and started asking questions. You know, I'm not, I'm not married. You know, is, is, can I still baptize my child? And I didn't have to answer that. There were other people from our community and saying, yes, this is my story. This is what happened to me. This is how I became part of this community. And out of the first ad that we put out, this is one of the little girls that got baptized. Then we had like seven kids, seven families that came to be baptized on, the, on that Sunday, on that Easter Sunday service that we didn't know before. You know? So you're talking about evangelism. It's about using all the different tools that we have to tell them about this good news. And then people need to have a, almost like a window to who you really are and your values again. You know, you're, what do I need to do for that? Do, do I need to pay? Those are the kind of questions that we were asked. You know, and that's, that's another kid that on that day. One, you know, we, having no space, you have to find places where you're going to do things. And we had done a VVS in, in, uh, in the Lions Club every year, air conditioned, really pretty. And they were going into transition. They sold their building to the city, and they were going to build another building. And they said, like, we'll finish it before your VVS, we promise. And they didn't. You know, we had every, every July we had our VVS. And I said, like, well, I guess we don't do it this year, you know get to rest. And, and then I got a call. I said, like, no, we need to find another place. What, what about the park? I was here. It's almost like the box falling. You know? Like, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a, I saw it. In the heat in, in Texas, you know, humidity and, and equipment that needs to be put and, and stuff like that. And this is what happened. Let me show you a little bit of the video. Just some baby shampoo and water. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I, I know that I went over my time by one minute, but all I wanted to say is that these are the people that I thought I was bringing the good news, but they were setting you know, what happened there, it was a daily thing. We did it for a whole week. And that thing had to be come back into the trailer and then out the next day in the heat and then put it back at the end of the evening, put it the next, set it up again. And that was the whole week. And they were able to do that because they had experienced something. And now they needed to share it with somebody else. And they couldn't stop. And I think that's what evangelism is. Amen? Thank you so much for, for, for your attention. Yeah.